May you have power together with all the saints to grasp how high and long and wide and deep is the love of Christ. To know this love that surpasses knowledge, that you may be filled to the measure of all the fullness of God. Amen. Word of God for our consideration today, as I had announced earlier, is a portion of the gospel lesson from Luke chapter 1. I read again from verse 46. And Mary said, My soul praises the greatness of the Lord, and my spirit rejoices in God my Savior, because he's looked with favor on the humble condition of his servant. Surely from now on all generations will call me blessed, because the Mighty One has done great things for me, and his name is holy. His mercy is from generation to generation of those who fear him. He's done a mighty deed with his arm. He's scattered the proud because of the thoughts of their hearts. He's toppled the mighty from their thrones and exalted the lowly. He has satisfied the hungry with good things and has sent the rich away empty. He has helped his servant Israel, remembering his mercy to Abraham and his descendants forever, just as he spoke to our ancestors. This is God's word. Dear brothers and sisters in Christ, you have used a magnifying glass before. Back in high school, in, in science class, we, uh, when we peered through the uh, microscope in, in, in the science classes, what we basically had was a, a, a fancy, high-powered version of it. Uh, I've reached an age in my life now where uh, I need to have some kind of a, a magnifying lens in the bottom of my glasses just to be able to read. And of course, you understand that when you magnify something with a magnifying glass, you aren't actually making it bigger. The, the object is the same. It re, that, that remains fixed. You, you, we, we, we can't do that. It, it simply appears bigger to us and to anyone else who might be looking through the magnifying glass. Today before we, us, we have uh, Mary's song. That, that song that she sang when she came to the home of her cousin uh, Elizabeth that is known to many people as the Magnificat. Uh, Magnificat is simply Latin for magnify, uh, to, to make something great. And the, the opening line of the, the English for this song of Mary in the Old English of the King James still still use that word magnify in it. My soul doth magnify the Lord, and my spirit hath rejoiced in God my Savior. Does it seem odd to magnify God? I mean, He's already the biggest thing there is. Literally, the entire universe fits inside of him. You can't make God any bigger than he already is. And yet, despite that fact, many people have some trouble seeing him, it would uh, appear. They, they, they claim that they don't really see him at all, or they have a kind of a fuzzy image of who he is and what he is like. And we ourselves have to admit that sometimes it's hard for us to see him clearly. And we ourselves have lived our lives and behaved in ways that would seem to indicate at the moment it's as though he doesn't exist at all. When Jesus came into the world, the Lord was showing himself to us as clearly as he ever had before. And Mary's song anticipates this arrival of our Lord coming to us in the form of the person Jesus. It, it makes this a perfect time to magnify the Lord, to let the world see how big he is. And now today, as Christmas approaches, the time has come. The time has come for us to make the Lord look big. 
In, in Mary's song, we, we, we get to see why and, and how and an idea of just how big he is when uh, her, her words show us uh, that he shows his grace to the lowly. And he, he brings down those who think they are big. And he keeps his promises to his people. The standards for measuring how big big God is may not be uniform across the whole world and they, they may not be what people think they should be. Any number of religions will see God as having uh, miraculous power and performing great acts of might on the earth. Back in ancient times, that's why the mythologies of the Greeks and the Romans were, were entertaining, if not always so comforting. Those people today who worship uh, the god Allah see him as uh, laying down very strict standards for behavior and right and wrong, laying out uh, certain laws to keep and, and see uh, that uh, God comes to judge those who don't keep them. And it is for that reason that those worshipers of Allah refer to their religion as Islam, which when translated means submission. Submission. Now, as Christians, we, we believe these same things about God. That's true. We, we believe that he is uh, a worker of great miracles, that he has displayed mighty acts of power uh, throughout time. We, we also understand that he gives us a very clear standard of right and wrong and that he condemns those who don't keep it. But this is not the reason we magnify the Lord. This is not the big thing that we want everybody to see. Rather, uh, as Mary reveals in her song, this is the... The grace, that this is the God who, who shows uh, his grace to the lowly. The Lord looks big for another reason. And Mary said, my soul praises the greatness, or magnifies, the Lord, and my spirit rejoices in God my Savior. Why? Because he has looked with favor on the humble condition of his servant. Surely, from now on, all generations will call me blessed, because the mighty one has done great things for me, and his name is Holy. Well, before we look at what Mary is saying about the Lord, let's take a, a step back and see what she has to say in this song about herself. In calling him my Savior, she is indirectly admitting that she is a, a sinner, just like us. Perfect people don't need to be saved. And we need to keep that in mind as well, don't we? We aren't always so eager to own up to our sins. Now, to, to be certain, uh, we don't need to brag about them. We, we, we certainly don't need to advertise them to everybody. But what happens if we don't take them seriously? It's, it's a little bit like that person who has some condition like cancer or diabetes or alcoholism, a, a deadly disease that could affect them in terrible, terrible ways. And yet they don't want to think about it. They don't want to give it the proper uh, attention. I have ministered personally to people who, who didn't take the, the, their, their health condition seriously and just let it run its course. And the progress it takes was not good. This is, many of them didn't really own up to it and take it seriously until they were bedridden. They, they had brought uh, unnecessary misery upon themselves. It's better to have the doctor expose the problem. It's better to take it seriously and get the help you need now to take your medicines and to pursue a proper course of treatment before it's too late. Mary also describes her humble condition. Now, understand that she is not praising herself for the virtue of humility. She rather is recognizing that her, her situation truly was a lowly one. Mary was a young girl living in a culture that undervalued women. Mary was a citizen of the city of Nazareth and the region of Galilee, both of which were parts of the nation of Israel, that, that frankly, the other people in Israel thought were a bit poor and backwards. Mary was a Jew. 
a, a conquered people living under the dominion and power of the Roman Empire. And in addition to all of that, as we've already said, Mary was a sinner, just like you and me, someone who was going to have to answer to a holy God. On many points, we, we believe today, perhaps, that we compare favorably to Mary. And, and on some of them, rightly so. Our citizenship in our country, our our, our, our station in life for many of us means that there is a certain respectability that comes to us. But I'm going to guess that most of you still see plenty of lowliness in your condition and situation as well. Our faith, our background, our, our, our age, our health, our wealth, our popularity, all of these things likely fail to elevate us so much as we might like. Uh, our, our, our faith and our, our church is one that makes it seem odd to some people out there, maybe even to some other Christians. I have a cousin who uh, once accused us of being a cult because we don't just flow with the uh, more currents of uh, <clears throat> contemporary morals that so many other churches like his do. And then we still share the universal problem of sin. That alone is enough to conclude that we are living in a humble state, a lowly state, just like she was. Now, if, if, you, were a, if, you, if you were a jeweler and you wanted to make a, a white, brilliant pearl stand out as much as you could, what would you do? Maybe you would... Uh, Place it on a black velvet background and shine a bright light on it. And isn't that, in a sense, what Mary has done with God's bigness, with his grace for us here? In, in, against the black background of our lowly condition and our sin, her lowly condition, her sin. She places that brilliant pearl of God's grace and makes it stand out for all to see. It makes God's quality shine all the brighter. These are the qualities that make him so big to us. He has looked with favor on the humble condition of his servant. The Lord doesn't use our lowly condition as a reason for rejecting us or even just to criticize us. Well, he's always looking. He has his eyes on you and me at all times, but he looks with favor. He, he, he doesn't look at us to find an opportunity to destroy us but or to take advantage of us. He's looking for ways to help. He shows his grace to the lowly. And that's what Mary says he has done. The mighty one has done great things for me and his name is holy. Only one person in all of human history could bear the Savior of the world and give birth to to the Son of God. Mary had been given a great honor. That cannot be denied. And yet notice that she doesn't say the Mighty One has done a great thing for me, but she says it in the plural, great things. In doing so, she's really taking the, the entire collection of God's promises, past, present, and future, and applying them to herself, claiming them as her very own. Her baby would be her savior from sin, just as he is for us. Her baby was coming to bring her God's love. It was in him that she would find forgiveness of sins. It was he who was coming to give her a life that never ends. Great things. Great things that God has done. Those are bigger gifts from a bigger God than one who merely breaks the rules of uh, nature and physics from time to time with some mighty act or who uh, simply lays down the law and comes to enforce it as though he is a uh, little more than a cosmic policeman. His mercy 
It's from generation to generation on those who fear him. Well, this, this kindness, this grace, isn't just for Mary, is it? It extends to every generation, generations upon generations, like she had learned from her Old Testament, Deuteronomy chapter 7, where, where God spoke of showing his love to a thousand generations of those who love him. Do you know how long a generation lasts? We usually would say that there are about three or four generations per century. Well, add them all up. And that means that the total number of generations that have existed since the beginning of recorded history don't even begin to add up to thousands. Through time, God has Express this grace to the lowly for so many across so much time. It's a unique greatness of the God who shows such grace. And with Christmas coming, the time has come to make God look so big as his grace and mercy reveals he is with our prayers and praise. Now, at the same time that the Lord is lifting up the lowly, he is also working in the other direction, in another quarter, in another place. And Mary also praises God, wants to make him look big because he is the same God who brings down those who think that they are big. Uh, He has done a mighty deed with his arm. He has scattered the proud because of the thoughts of their hearts. He's toppled the mighty from their thrones and exalted the lowly. He has satisfied the hungry with good things and sent the rich away empty. Well, who are the big people the Lord brings down? Mary describes them as uh, proud wannabes. She describes them as people who uh, rule many people. These are people who are well-fed, fat, rich people. They think they're so much because they have imagined importance for themselves in their own hearts. Because, as uh, politicians or rulers, they have so many people under them uh, because they have so much more stuff than everybody else. Well, in our time, simply, we might describe them as what? Celebrities or politicians or billionaires. People like this often impress us too, don't they? We... We would like to ingratiate ourselves to them. We want to stay on their good side. Sometimes they even intimidate us. So we uh, fawn over them and we flatter them. We try to win their favor. We join their fan clubs. We we, we believe the propaganda that uh, it's out there perhaps at least a little bit that they're just a little better than the rest of us. We work in their campaigns. We, we offer our own sacrifices, if you will, at the altar of their cult of the personality. Sometimes we, we find that they are people who even inspire us and motivate us. We think that we would like to be more like them. And so we start to adopt their behaviors. We imitate their morals and their mannerisms, that is a mistake. Mary has made it very clear what God's intent is with these people. The Lord scatters them. He, he topples them. He, he sends them away empty. It's his purpose to bring them down, to, to make them fall. That's his intent. Now, We don't always see this happen publicly, perhaps, but we catch a glimpse often enough, someone who has built his little personal kingdom to himself here on earth appears on the news because he's fallen from grace and he's fallen so far and it's all come to nothing. And these little empires these people put together for themselves, this this little heaven on earth that they have tried to build, well, it turns out to look a lot more like that other place down there in the end. That isn't because the Lord's trying to be cruel or mean. 
It's because he needs us to see clearly the, 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 the falseness. He needs us to be able to see clearly the emptiness of, of human aspirations to greatness. He, he, he also needs them to wake up and see him clearly, at least to have the opportunity to see how much they need him. And he wants uh, and needs us to see clearly how much greater he is by comparison. So he brings down those who think they are big just so that we might see how big he actually is. We may make him big as he is. Not like those who make claims for themselves. Finally, uh, Mary concludes her song with one last truth that makes the Lord look bigger than anyone else. He keeps his promises to his people. He has helped his servant Israel, remembering his mercy to Abraham and his descendants forever, just as he spoke to our ancestors. Now, Mary talks about Israel and she talks about Abraham, but let's remember that this applies to you and to me as well. We are also that Israel and descendants of that Abraham. Well, you, you and I may not be Jewish people. We may not be literal citizens of a nation called Israel, but r remember that it is not a, a political entity that concerns God so much as Israel. He is looking for those people who trust in his promises by faith as his Israel. <clears throat> And Abraham may not be literally a part of our physical family trees, but we are his children nonetheless, Paul teaches us. And he is our true spiritual father because we share his faith. We own the same promises the Lord gave to him. God's promises of help and uh, mercy for Abraham and Israel were already 2,000 years old when Mary first spoke these words. Gen generations had come and gone. Uh, centuries came and went. And during that time, there were many people who, who gave up on those promises of God. 2,000 years. There were others who simply forgot them, but not the Lord. He remembers his promises. He, he remembers them in the sense, not, not that for a little while they escaped his memory, but he remembers them in the sense that they at, at, at all times were before him. That, that he, he always had them on his heart and mind as he drove the entire course of world history towards our salvation. It was this bringing of a savior. It was this forgiveness of sins. It was the salvation for mankind that was on his mind and in his purposes. These things he remembers. No one else is big enough to, to keep such promises and extend them over such a long period of time as he is. And, and we live just as many years on the other side of their fulfillment, don't we? The Lord is still keeping his promise of help and mercy to you and to me today. Mary's son took our sins to the cross no less than others. He has made the payment that frees us from our guilt and frees us from death. And then through time, he has continued to take these gospel promises, this message of salvation, this forgiveness of sins, this good news, and he kept it alive. He kept it alive generation after generation until it came to the pastor or parent or teacher or evangelist who brought those promises to you and share them with each of us. He gave us his Holy Spirit so that we might realize them and, and make them our very own by faith. We stand here as evidence today that God keeps his promises to his people. And Christmas is the perfect time, the perfect time to hold God's promises up and make the Lord look as big and as faithful as his mercy and his help reveal he is. On Friday of this week, we will pause again to remember how our God appeared 
in a helpless newborn. The Lord and creator of all the universe fit himself into a little box made for holding animal feed. Love drove him to join our human race to save us. You couldn't make a God like that look too big. Amen. Amen. Please stand. Now may the peace of God that passes all understanding keep your hearts and minds through faith in Christ Jesus. Amen.